Good evening, everybody. Across the whole of the United Kingdom, people are engaged in a huge joint effort to put the coronavirus back in its box. Throughout this pandemic, the government has done whatever it takes to protect lives and livelihoods in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. We put in place an unprecedented package of economic support, protecting the wages and jobs of millions of people. We've built the largest testing capacity in Europe, with 32 million tests conducted so far and over half a million tests now available every day across the UK. We've ensured, as we head into the winter, that the NHS has at its disposal over 30,000 ventilators and billions of items of personal protective equipment, most of it now manufactured here in the UK. Across the whole of the UK, we have a shared goal to suppress the virus, ensure the NHS is not overwhelmed, and in doing so, to save lives. The UK government and the devolved administrations are working together on a joint approach to the Christmas period because all of us want to ensure families can come together wherever they live. The challenges we face are significant across the UK. The average number of new cases each day is now 22,398. That's up from 9,716 a month earlier. There are now 12,320 patients in hospital, up from 2,602 a month earlier. 1,142 patients are now in mechanical ventilation, uh, mechanical ventilation beds, up from uh, 369 a month earlier. And sadly, 492 deaths were reported yesterday, and the weekly average number of deaths each day is now 295, up from 53 a month earlier. So that's why uh, new restrictions are in place in each part of the UK. And in England, from today, we're once again asking you to stay at home. As I explained on Saturday, you can only leave home for specific reasons, for work if you can't work from home, for education and for essential activities and emergencies. The full rules, all the details are available at gov.uk forward slash coronavirus and on the NHS COVID-19 apps. And please log on to see what you can and can't do. I know how tough this is uh, for staff in uh, the NHS and care homes uh, who are facing a tough winter on the front line, for, for families who can't meet in the, the way that they would want to, for businesses forced to shut just as you're getting back on your feet. I know that the many of you are anxious, weary and quite frankly fed up with the very mention of this virus, but I want to assure you this is not a repeat of the spring. Schools, universities and nurseries are all staying open and these measures, though they are tough, are time limited. The advice I've, re I've received uh, suggests that four weeks is enough for these measures to make a real impact. So these rules will expire and on the 2nd of December we plan to move back to a tiered approach. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We have better treatments and techniques to, ca to take care of those in hospital, thanks largely to the ingenuity of British scientists. Rapid testing is being rolled out on a massive scale, uh, with citywide testing starting tomorrow in Liverpool. And I'm hugely grateful to the people of Liverpool for their participation in this pilot. I hope that by working together, we can get that uh, great city on top of the virus. More broadly, uh, there is also the very real chance of safe and effective vaccines. So taking those things together, these scientific advances can show us the way ahead. And in the meantime, this government will continue to support people affected by these new restrictions. As you know, we've protected almost 10 million jobs through furlough. And as the Chancellor announced earlier today, we're now extending the scheme through to March. We're also extending our support for the self-employed so that the next payment increases to 80% of average products.
uh, profits. Uh, we're providing cash grants for businesses who are closed worth more than £1 billion every month. We're giving £1.1 billion pounds, uh, to local authorities in England to support businesses, and a further £2 billion pounds of funding is guaranteed for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. As we face these challenges together, we must look after those most in need. As of September, we've helped over 29,000 rough sleepers off the streets, two-thirds of whom are now in settled accommodation. Today, we're announcing a further £15 million pounds to help councils offer safe accommodation for people who are sleeping rough or at risk of becoming homeless. This programme will help areas that need additional support most during the restrictions and throughout the winter. These are difficult times and uh, while it pains me to have to ask once again for so many to give up so much, I know that together we can get through this. So please, for the next four weeks, stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. I'll now hand over to the head of NHS England, Simon Stevens, who's going to talk about the preparations for winter. Simon. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon. Knowing I was coming over here uh, this afternoon, I took the opportunity earlier today to ask some of my uh, fellow NHS staff, uh, some of the nurses, the paramedics, the intensive care doctors, uh, what would they would like to use this opportunity to say to you, uh, the viewers, uh, our neighbours, our friends. And I think it essentially boiled down to these three points. First, that this second wave of coronavirus is real and it's serious. Second, that the health service has been working incredibly hard to prepare and to catch up on the care that was disrupted during the first wave. But thirdly, our ability to continue to do that is crucially dependent on what happens to the growth of the coronavirus infection. Left unchecked, it will disrupt care. So perhaps I can just spend a moment uh, on each of those uh, three points. The first then is that uh, we clearly are seeing a big increase in the number of coronavirus patients in hospitals. Uh, like you, and I'm sure the Prime Minister won't mind me saying so, uh, I've watched a number of these uh, press briefings and sometimes the uh, charts can be a bit hard to uh, keep up with, so I've just got one chart today uh, that indisputably sets out what we in the health service are seeing. And if we can have that uh, one chart, please, what it shows is the number of patients that are being looked after in hospitals across England. And you can see that at the beginning of September, that was under 500 patients. By the beginning of October, that had become 2,000 coronavirus inpatients. And now, at the beginning of November, that is over 11,000. That's the equivalent of 22 of our hospitals across England full of coronavirus patients. Those are facts. Those are not projections, forecasts, speculation. Those are the patients in hospital today. And as we think about the next few weeks, in a sense, we already know what is likely to happen because today's infection is the intensive care order book for a fortnight's time. And this little animation, I think, shows that the way this particular virus works means that there are these lags between infections and hospitalizations and either cures or illness severely resulting in avoidable death. So if we can just see the little animation, I think that will show that between getting the infection and knowing you've got it, there's typically a five-day period, and then for those patients who become severely ill, two to five days before they end up in hospital, and then in total, 10 days or so from getting infected to being in hospital, and up to two to four weeks between being infected and actually being able to go home well, or unfortunately having died. So the reason why action is needed is because the infections that are happening now are part of what will produce that increase in hospitalizations. Just for comparison, the 11,000 coronavirus patients that we've got in hospital compares with about 3,000 patients that we would typically have 
in hospital on any one day during a very bad winter flu season for flu. It compares with about 7,000 patients who would be in hospital today being looked after for cancer. And so this is not really speculation, this is fact. And we know that in certain parts of the country, the number of coronavirus patients that hospitals are looking after is already significantly over the number that they were having to cope with during the April 1st peak. But that's not true everywhere, fortunately. We've got parts of the country where actually coronavirus uh, is rising, but nevertheless hospitals are coping well. But if it continues to increase in other parts of the country, it will have knock-on consequences. So we're by no means alone in this. If you look at hospitals across Europe, you can see that they are filling up. Uh, hospitals in uh, the Netherlands, uh, in Spain, in Belgium, uh, in Germany and France, uh, the uh, Chancellor of Germany declaring that German intensive care units would be full within a few weeks, uh, the President of France, President Macron, declaring that French hospitals would be running out of beds if infection was left unchecked. So I think the first point that my colleagues across the health service just really want to underline is that this second wave of COVID is real and it is serious. But the second point is, I think, just to share with you the extraordinary work that they have been doing to ensure that the health service is as best able to cope, not just with the rise of coronavirus, but the usual winter pressures, and, of course, all the other care that we offer. So, as the Prime Minister said, we've got uh, new treatments uh, that have been uh, trialled and tested uh, here in the NHS. As a result, the death rate uh, in hospital, for some patients at least, has more than halved since the beginning of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. We are doing very well, thanks to the brilliant work of uh, GPs in expanding flu vaccine uptake uh, this winter, which is so important given that if you have flu and coronavirus at the same time, you're twice as likely to die from coronavirus than you otherwise would. And that's why it's great that two and a half million more people have had their flu jab this time this year compared to the same time last year. And as we've been discussing in the last day or two, there are uh, prospects for coronavirus vaccines, and the NHS wants to be ready to administer those just as soon as they become available. We've also been kitting out hospitals and uh, with extra facilities and equipment, uh, expanding uh, intensive care units, uh, 159 A&Es uh, getting investment to be able to separate the COVID from the non-COVID uh, patients they're looking after. We've substantially expanded testing. We've got a four-month uh, PPE stockpile uh, from the government, and nurses, doctors are going hammer and tongs to catch up on the disrupted care that happened from the first wave. More than a million people today will have seen their uh, family doctor or had an appointment. Uh, cancer treatments are now back at above their normal level, and routine operations in parts of the country where there is not substantial coronavirus uh, are now uh, back at uh, approaching their normal levels. So preparation has been substantial, uh, the disrupted care, the health service is getting on with uh, tackling. But the third point, alongside the reality of the second wave, the work to prepare that has been done, that my colleagues just uh, fundamentally want to uh, try and convey, is that we do need your help. There is this um, slogan, uh, protect the NHS. Uh, I think from the point of view of people working in the NHS, what that really means is help us help you. Uh, protect our ability to offer the full range of health services, the routine operations, the cancer treatment, the mental health uh, services, the community nursing uh, that is required. Staff are working flat out. The good news is we've got more nurses, 13,000 more nurses than we had a year ago, but coronavirus affects NHS staff just like everybody else, and this has been an incredibly stressful time. So I think I can put it no better in conclusion than the words of um, an intensive care doctor that I was with yesterday, Dr. Alison Pittard, who said, in the here and now, we can't stop cancer developing. In the here and now, we can't immediately uh, prevent heart attacks or strokes. And hospitals, of course, have got to respond to those. But we can reduce the spread of coronavirus in the community. And that is what we need to do to be able to care for everybody who needs it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, and I think uh, uh, on behalf of, of everybody who in, in government, thank you to you and to everybody in the NHS for, for the incredible job uh, that, that you're doing. I want to go to questions from the, from the public.